Well, the secret the secret has been spoiled. I came in yesterday, last night, and I dropped off three things of Red Bull. Okay. Actually, so I, last night I was dropping off stuff for the snack cart, so I figured I'd drop it off. And I was going to wait until the beginning of class. But on, honestly, you know, many of the students in this class have to go from this one to 303, yeah. which is like a lateral move right there. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so you're going to need all the caffeine you can get from, from, from this. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you need help, okay, get the Red Bull. You probably should slam the Red Bull because the stuff tastes like a mixture of Dr. Pepper and grapefruit juice. It's just awful. It's not something you drink for the flavor. It's something you drink for the caffeine. But still. <laughs> so while while so uh, while the distribution is taking place, I'm gonna put these in front of Tyler for the have enough energy yeah. all right but uh so quick some few announcements that we have to go through so um today we're covering chapter 13 wednesday is our final net suite activity our very last one in the course you know we're almost there yeah and then friday we're doing our final excel activity so this is a week of ends you know, so we're also uh, yeah <laughs> celebration or oh yeah. uh we also have homework uh for chapter 13 on wednesday um next week so next week we are doing chapter 14 on Monday. Wednesday is a homework assignment, all right? So please note that your homework assignment is normally due on Friday. Um, we're doing a homework assignment on Wednesday next week, so a quick turnaround. We're not doing Excel in class on Wednesday. We're just doing the homework assignment. And then Friday, depending on how good you guys are this rest of this week, again, the reason I brought Red Bull is because I want your energy level high for the rest of this, the next week and a half. But uh, um, depending on how you are, We'll be out of class on next Friday before Thanksgiving break, okay? Now, if the behavior is bad, if I'm so sitting here talking and I hear crickets in the background, like literal crickets in the background, then uh, then I'm going to I'm going to going to uh, think rethink my plan for leaving on Wednesday. So again, get the get the energy levels high. Uh, I know it's going to be hard for today because today is challenge, but w uh, next uh, Monday should be interesting. So reminders on dates. Uh, please remember Monday right after Thanksgiving break, your professional interaction is due. If you've already done that and submitted it, great. If you have not, you might want to try to get to that taken care of sooner rather than later. Again, if you email me during Thanksgiving break and uh, you say, I've not done the professional interaction yet, help, I'll say, uh, we've had an entire semester for this, guys. You know, so uh, please make sure you take care of that. Wednesday after Thanksgiving break is exam two. Uh, as I promised, I will have the exam materials available for you before Thanksgiving break. I won't wait until Thanksgiving break to post those because that's just that's just cruel. So my plan is to have it up by next Monday. That will be uh, that will be the date. Hopefully next week or this coming weekend, I'll have it done. Um, and then finally, presentations in the final week of the semester. I have not received any uh, requests for topics yet or presentation dates. I would like to have that resolved by the end of this week. So please reach out to your group and get that taken care of. So first come, first serve on uh, presentation dates and group uh, topics. So if you have a topic that you're really, really in, in passionate about and want to present about, you might want to select that soon. And uh, if we get to uh, Friday at the end of class and uh, I have groups that have not selected topics, I will reach out to the groups and say, guys, you don't want me to select a topic for you because it will be the most boring topic in the world. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll make you present on internal controls and not just any controls, the really boring controls. Yes. So please make sure you reach out and think about those topics. All right. As I promised, we're doing controls today. So let me just start this by saying this is not an exciting topic. It is very tedious. The slides are very tedious. I can't make this exciting as much as I try. I've got some interesting anecdotes to share, but this is going to be one of the more challenging ones. That being said, this is super important. This covers every single aspect of business that you will face. It's very relevant, not just from a controls or not just from a technology perspective, but from an environmental operations perspective. So again, you're gonna have to dig deep for the uh, for the energy on this one because there's some a lot of details on this, and it's going to be very important that you know this. I would say probably I, I shouldn't say probably this is the most important chapter in this entire course. So please make sure that you're following the content that I provide for you and that you know what's going on. Uh, so. There will, there will likely be uh, three to four multiple choice questions on this on the exam, plus the four of the problems will have, a, or the problem will have a, a discussion on this, these topics. 
So let's just start out simple. Let's start it simple. We've talked about controls already in this course. All right. So what is the definition of control? Well, control is a process designed to, designed to provide reasonable assurance that management objectives related to the quality of data, the effectiveness of operations, and the compliance of applicable laws and like, uh, regulations will be achieved, which is a really big mouthful. And I wouldn't expect anybody to know that detailed definition. I mean, if you, if you can re regurgitate it verbatim what I just said, kudos to you, especially since I stumbled when I was talking. All right. So what is a control? What is the easy definition? One of the things that I like to say is a control is just simply a response to a risk. That's all there is to it. So we identify the risk, we respond to the risk appropriately. That's 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 all we need to know. Now, the reason we try to keep this part simple is because everything else is complex and detailed. So let's just make this as straightforward as possible. All right. Broadly speaking, the goals of internal control are to safeguard assets. Obviously, we want to make sure that organizational assets are going to be held in uh, necessary condition. We want to have sufficient records because we do need that for providing information to people, external stakeholders, and people associated with the organization. Uh, provide accurate and reliable information for the same info detail we just talked about. Prepare financial reports according to established criteria. Uh, it's important to note that this does not necessarily need to be generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, you will start talking about this a little bit more in your higher level business courses, but we teach you GAAP back in 220, but that doesn't mean everybody operates according to GAAP, all right? Accrual-based accounting is spurious at best for many organizations, but usually large organizations, yes. Promote and approve to operational efficiency. These are going to be operational controls, as we're going to talk about here in just a second. Encourage adherence with managerial policy and then compliance with laws and regulations, which is another objective of controls. So we're going to see when we talk about controls, three objective categories, and they're going to kind of relate to these concepts that we're talking about here. We have three general categories of internal controls. And when I talk about these general categories, we're talking about broadly internal controls. So technology or not technology driven controls which we are concerned about both in this course, although we're gonna focus on the technology controls. So preventative controls. So these deter the problems from ever occurring. Like an example of this would be authorization of transactions. Something that's a little bit easier to understand is think about a control that I use on the exams. When you all are taking your exam, I'm watching you, observing you take the exam, what your patterns are, what your habits are. I do not want you ever cheating on my exam in the first place. So that my control is, is to make sure that I'm very, very closely uh, de or closely watching what you're doing and making sure that the cheating doesn't ever actually occur. Now, I'm not talking about this class specifically, because of course, nobody in this class would ever cheat. You guys are great, all right? But I have had cheating occur in other classes, other courses that I've taught in this, at this university. So obviously that control is not sufficient unto itself. So let's talk about the other types. Detective controls, these are discover problems that are not prevented. So even though I do my best to try to make sure that something doesn't happen, sometimes uh, something gets past me. And so do I have routines that I follow to try to make sure that things are correct? Yes. Like if I see people that are constantly sitting to next to each other in a class and see they interact really closely and they're very, very tight, I might, I might uh, check and see, do their exam answers seem, seem similar to one another, okay? Like, did they answer the same multiple choice question answers? Do they answer the same, do they use the same verbiage on the uh, short answer questions? So that might be an indication that uh, maybe something got past me. It could also be an indication that just great minds think alike, okay? But uh, that would be a way that we could actually approach that. Uh, example from a business perspective is bank reconciliations and month trial about monthly trial balances. So we check things after the fact to see if there are any problems which uh, reconciliations are very useful for that. Not just right bank reconciliations, but any type of financial reconciliation. That's one reason why you should check your credit card statements at the end of the year, so, or the end of the month, excuse me, to make sure that there are no transactions that are uh, that you don't recognize. And then corrective controls. These are usually related to, uh, the, the. these are usually tied to the detective controls. These correct and recover from problems that have been identified. So we identify a problem, something that got past our, our, our controls, we say, we need to fix this problem. So example would be backup or files to cover corrupted data. And backup files are very, very useful. Just ask Truman State in April of 2023, okay? If they had not had backup files, then things would be much, much worse for it from a technolog technological perspective. So kudos to ITS on that regard, all right? So make sure that we've got that. Be very, very, uh, it's very, very straightforward. We detect a problem. We wanna make sure we have a remedial plan in place to address the problem. All right. So these are, like I said, these are general categories of controls, uh, general categories of controls. And almost all controls that we talk about will fall into one of these three categories. Usually I like to classify these according to two basic categories. I like to say preventative controls, 
and then controls that are detective slash corrective, because usually you don't have a detective control without a corrective control to follow it. But broadly speaking, we have three categories. Also remember from chapter five, we have two broad categories controls over information systems, okay? So general or access controls, these limit who can access the information system and the areas that are assessed information system that are accessible to each user. Now, again, we talk about this as to uh, people logging into the uh, logging into uh, Brightspace or logging into their computers in 1420. That would be an example of a general or access control. And generally, these tend, tend to pertain to enterprise-wide issues, so controls over access in the network, developing, maintaining applications, and things like that. So that's an easy way to think about that. Then we have our application controls. This is basically an automated control, okay? And these relates to, uh, uh, provides detail for data integrity, 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 and an audit trail. This is usually specific to a subsystem or application, ensure the validity, completeness, and accuracy of the transactions. I know it's been some time since we've talked about this, but remember we had two words that we were concerned about with respect to these particular controls. These were basically what we were looking for when we talked about these controls. If we're talking about an organization, remember general controls, we were looking for what do employees do, all right? What do employees do? If we're talking about application controls, we're talking about what do systems do? And so that was the way that we delineated these two types of controls. All right, so we've already gone through a lot already. We've just scratched the surface. So I guess it's time to take a break. So let's do a pop quiz, what do you say? Okay, it's a pop quiz. It's an informal pop quiz, okay? It's a formal pop quiz. You guys heard these uh, companies before, or at least so there should be at least one of these you see up here. Well, like see the big E, you're gonna be like, okay, I know they're the bad guys. All right. So uh, these are these. So the first two are companies that actually went through massive financial scandals back in 2002, Enron and WorldCom. And if you're not familiar with these, well, you will become familiar with these at some point. But there's some fascinating things that are associated with both of these. And then, of course, we have the accounting firm down there at the bottom. It's Anderson. They were part of the big five. And you might say, Dr. Barnes, it's only big four, isn't it? I said it was big five. Now it's only big four because Anderson's no longer here. Ha, ha, ha. Plot twist. All right. I'm sorry. I spoiled it. My apologies. My apologies, guys. Spoiled the plot twist. Um, so uh, that's what those have in common. And these all occurred, uh, all these uh, failures occurred in the early uh, part of the 21st century. So 2002, 2003 is kind of when this all went down. And so... Why did this happen? Well, basically, at the time, uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of uh, what sort I'm looking for um, flexibility, okay, in financial reporting, and companies were not necessarily following the rules they should have been following. Did they follow the rules by the letter? Yes. Did they follow the rules by intention? Not really. They said we can abuse this rule and we can take advantage of it. We don't necessarily need to worry about. Uh, the auditors coming in and telling us we're doing something wrong. And so uh, that was a real big problem. We started talking about what was happening at the beginning of 20, 21st century. Probably more importantly is that we were focused more on end results than we were about processes. So uh, the way that I, the way I described this in 417, I'm going to spoil this for some of you guys. Some of you say, I remember the story from uh, 367 and some people are just going to be grossed out the first time all around. But uh I, this is the question I ask when I, when I start out my lecture in auditing. And I say, uh, so uh, one of my favorite places to eat is Seabreeze. It's a place uh, up north of Kirksville. And I probably mentioned it already. Uh, I actually went there last night and I had my standard meal. I have a cheeseburger because cheeseburgers are delicious. All right. And if you, if you argue with me, I'll fight you. All right. But cheeseburger is delicious. Now, I, let's say that I go to Seabreeze. And this has never happened, by the way. I don't want to give them a bad reputation. This is just a, a, a hypothetical example. But let's say I'm sitting there waiting for my Sunday night cheeseburger, and I'm just really, really excited. And I, the door opens, and I see them prepping my cheeseburger, and whoever's prepping it sneezes on it. Okay? Would that change my experience? Probably so. It doesn't really matter if the cheeseburger will still be delicious. Am I going to eat it at all? Okay? That is what we're talking about when we talk about the process, is that a lot of organizations were focused on the end result. The end result doesn't really matter if the process itself is corrupted. So along came this thing called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, and I'm sure you've probably heard of that. you probably heard about some vernacular, which I'm going to refer to. It's socks, okay? It's socks. I always wanted to actually, I'm going to get a dog one day. I'm actually going to name it socks, and it's not going to be S-O-C-K-S, it's S-O-X. It's going to be Sarbanes-Oxley Barnes, and I'm going to be so clever for it. But Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, the goal is to improve the transparency of corporate disclosures by publicly traded, issued by publicly traded companies. All right. So the idea being is we wanted to improve transparency and understand more about the process. 
It also established the PCAOB to oversee uh, over auditing of publicly traded companies. So there's association there, which you guys will encounter more throughout the throughout your uh, business careers. Uh, so SOX mandated the improvement of free port areas of organizational controls, corporate governance, and auditor oversight. So corporate governance is organizational policies and procedures that safeguard stakeholder interest. So we know that people who are associated with the organization, they have differing interests, but everybody is reliant on that organization doing their job properly. If you're a shareholder, you want the organization to stay in business. If you're an employee, you want the organization to stay in business. If you're a vendor, a customer, you see where I'm going with this. All right. That's kind of where the stakeholder interest goes, is that corporate governance is trying to make sure that we follow what the stakeholders need. We do what the stakeholders need. Auditors, which are not going to go into a lot of detail in this course, but we'll talk about a lot uh, for those of you moving on to 417, that basically we're trying to ensure that what management says is correct. We're trying to provide independent oversight to make sure management's providing correct information to their stakeholders. So also not a direct result of Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, many organizations also incorporated a code of ethics to define and promote organizational values. Now, code of ethics can be viewed as a form of internal control. If it is, it's what we consider to be an entity level control, something that affects the entire organization, not just part of an organization. All right, so SOX 404 is something we're very concerned about, all right? And SOX 404 is a section of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that deals with management's responsibilities in regard to design, implementation, and maintenance of an organization's internal controls. So management of organizations is responsible for creating proper internal controls within the organization. They're going to create them, they're going to implement those, they're going to start them into action, and they're going to make sure that they're properly maintained as needed. Which was going that's that's important by the way because that will actually reflect on the COSO framework we're about to talk about in just a second. It also specifies auditors' the responsibilities for understanding and testing internal controls, but we'll talk about that more in 417. So those of you who are dodging me in 417, this is all you need to know. For those of you who are going to see me in another semester, well, we got more to talk about with this. So you're not done with internal controls yet. You're not done with internal controls yet. I don't know if that's going to scare you off or not. Well, that's, uh, we'll see what happens, okay? I know some of you are in my class next semester, so it's not that long. It's not that long before we'll see it again. All right. Now, let's talk very broadly about some control frameworks. Now, we're going to talk about five frameworks. One of these is going to be hypercritical to this particular course. So that's going to be the first one we talk about. But I'm responsible for understanding all five of these, at least, a, at least at a high level of what they represent. So I'm going to talk in a lot of detail about the first one. We're going to talk about the components. There's actually 17 principles also associated with it, but I'm not going to make you memorize those. Okay. I will tell you right now, Professor Amos used to make her AIS students memorize all 17 principles. Okay. So I want that going in my evaluation. Did not make me memorize 17 principles. All right. Or if, you could say that's a good thing. Or if you really wanted something to memorize, you could say that's a bad thing. I think there's more important things to focus on though. All right. So with respect to uh, publicly traded companies in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission requires these companies to evaluate internal controls best based on a recognized control framework. With respect to organizational governance, most organizations follow the COSO framework or the Committee on Sponsoring Organizations. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this part, but if you want to read in the book, what did sponsoring organizations mean? This was actually created back in 1986 by a whole group of uh, entities uh, so it's created by uh, the uh, or AICPA, the IMA, and then another one, that or AAA, Financial Executive International, and then the Institute of Internal Auditors. Again, you don't need to write all that down. I'm not going to test you on what the sponsoring organizations are. But a whole bunch of organizations that came in together and said, look, we're having problems with fraud that are occurring right now. And one of the things COSO identified is one of the best ways to mitigate fraud is to have proper internal controls. And so they created these things called the Internal Control Integrated Framework, which is going to be our focus for this particular section. So that's the first one. The COSO Internal Control Integrated Framework, we're going to focus on COSO 2013, which is the most recent adaptation of that. Now, there's been multiple revisions of it, but the components that we're going to talk about have been pretty consistent through the past 30 years. So that's one of our focus. We're also going to broadly talk about enterprise risk management, which is effectively just a version of the COSO internal control integrated framework on steroids, all right, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, use your own judgment, but it basically expands upon the COSO internal control integrated framework and adds a few different concepts. Also, we're going to talk about information technology governance because this is an AIS course, and we're going to talk about three frameworks that are relevant in this area. First one is control objectives for information related technology, which we're going to call COBIT, which is uh, really unfortunate. The most recent 
adaptation of COVID is uh, was in 2019. So people want to say COVID 2019, which sounds really, really bad. You know, did you say COVID 20? No, no. I think they actually renamed it to COVID four because of that. But yeah, it's 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 a really unfortunate acronym. And the problem was when I first started teaching advanced AIS, that was in the middle of a pandemic, so it was really really awkward. Yeah. Uh, information Technology Infrastructure Library, ITIL, which is going to deal with service management. And then yeah, I, ISO, International Organization for Standardization, ISO 27000 series. By the way, if you're curious why it's called ISO when it's International Organization for Standardization, it's actually a European organization, which the French vernacular for this actually puts the I in the S or the S before the O. So that's why it's ISO for International Organization for Standardization. But we're going to talk about those very high level. You don't need to know a lot of detail about those, but you do need to know what they accomplish, which we'll talk about here shortly. All right. So most widely adopted control framework in the United States is the COSO Internal Control Integrated Framework or COSO 2013. So it's a mouthful to say COSO Internal Control Integrated Framework every time. So I'm going to try to say COSO 2013 moving on. This cube is called the COSO cube, and we're going to see a similar cube when we talk about the ERA framework, uh, but uh, this basically represents different dimensions of controls of the organization. I do want to talk about this area right here, uh, the operating levels. We're not going to, I'm not going to make you memorize each of the operating levels because they're fairly apparent, but the, uh, what the concept that's trying to be conveyed here is, is that different types of controls will affect different areas of the organization. So remember when I was talking about the code of ethics just a little while ago, and I said that's like an entity level control, that would be a control that affects the whole organization. Something like uh, a segregation of duties within inventory, that would be more of an example of an, a control that would affect part of an organization, a certain area of the organization, we might say an operating unit or even a function. So when we talk about controls and we talk about the levels, it's important to note that not all controls are going to affect every part of the organization. They may be isolated to certain parts. Again, we're not going to focus too much on that concept. We're going to more broadly talk about what controls exist in place. But if you hear something like entity level control, keep in mind that we're talking about something that affects the organization as a whole. We are going to talk about these other two in detail, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to those slides. So the first one we're going to talk about is organizational objectives. Remember that big long list of, that was like in the third slide, okay? So the title slide, and then I talked about what is a control, and then I gave you a big long list of bullet points of what controls do. And I said they fall broadly in three areas. These are the objectives that we were talking about. Now, I will argue that probably the most important is this first one, all right? Mostly because I'm an auditor and I'm concerned most about this first one, but it's the reliability of financial reporting. And a lot of those bullet points that we talked about on that third slide had to deal with preparing, preparing information for reporting purposes. However, controls actually resonate in a bunch of different areas, okay? They uh, resonate with respect to reporting. We can also say that controls are going to help improve the effectiveness and efficiency of operations. Think about back to uh, 221, which again, I know uh, some people's like, no, stop, don't make me do this, Dr. Barnes, but uh, 221, remember those variance analysis, chapter 23? I'd say, okay, no, no, I don't remember. I don't want to remember that, Dr. Barnes. Yeah, I taught 221. I remember the variance analysis. I remember the the horror, the horror, yeah. But uh, yeah, um, so what is the whole purpose of a variance analysis? Just to come up with fancy numbers and show you can do cap or mathematics? No, so the whole point was is that if you identified a variance that was so far outside of expectation that you had to actually find out what the problem was, a variance analysis can be considered a form of operational control. Why are, why are we not meeting what our goals are in a certain area? Why are we so far off what we believed was going to be the correct amount? So that would be an example of an operational control, so those variance analysis from 220, or 221, okay? And then finally, compliance with laws and regulations. We have certain controls that are in place to make sure that we follow the rules. These are usually going to be specific to a, a certain industry. Different industries will have to follow different laws and different regulations depending on their operations. However, we're starting to see more of a move towards uh, pushes in this area at a broad level. Has anybody heard the term ESG? So enterprise social, or sorry, environment social governance. This is something that's become very prominent within business and accounting reporting. And so they're starting to develop laws and regulations that have uh, that affect how organizations affect the environment around them. So we might talk about controls that are relevant in that area as well. So again, reporting controls, operational controls, and compliance controls. We're going to be covering all three. I will say most of our controls will fall in the first category, but we'll talk about controls in all of these areas. Then, in addition to the previous objectives, COSA 13 is comprised of five primary components, all right? So here's a list of these. You can write these down, but we're going to go through each one of these in detail. 
I don't ask students to memorize, and I still hold to that, but you will need to know these five components. And it's beyond just knowing what they are. I'm not going to ask you, well, I might ask you a question to list them out, but that will very rarely be all I ever ask you to do. You're going to have to know what these five components represent with respect to the component. The good news is it's fairly intuitive once you actually understand what controls are trying to accomplish. So think about it this way. When an organization has a control issue or they, they have to decide about how to create a control, they've got certain things they need to do. First of all, they need to have a buy-in from the organization as a whole. The organization needs to say, there's a risk here. We need a control. Then we have to determine what is the risk. We have to say, how do we address the risk? And then we have to maintain that over time. That's basically all these, uh, these components represent. So let's talk, talk about these at very, very high level. Let's talk about these concepts at very high level here. How am I doing on time? Okay, about halfway through. We're good, we're good, okay. So the first of these is what I argue is probably the most important in the organization. And this is called the control environment, the control environment. So control environment is characterized by the actions and attitudes of the individuals who lead the organization, which you will hear me use the term tone at the top. All right. So this is going to include management's philosophy and operating style, the organization's commitment to integrity, ethical values and competence, internal control oversight by those charged with governance, which is going to be our board of directors or audit committee, who are the people who represent the stakeholders of the organization and our methods of assigning authority and responsibility. By and large, all this means is saying, how does the or how do the people at the top of the organization view internal controls? If they very much care about and make sure the controls are proper and doing the right thing, then controls will generally be very strong. If they don't really care about controls or not committed to it, they're just trying to get to numbers, then controls may be very weak. Remember that slide I showed you a few year, a few, a few slides ago where I had the uh, Enron and WorldCom? Those were really strong examples of people or organizations where the people who are at the top were not invested in the, the control, uh, were not invested in the controls. They did not have a strong tone at the top. The people who were there were saying, I wanna make as much money as possible and that is my objective. I don't particularly care if I have to cheat to get there. So let's go ahead and use a, an example of this. Let's think about an example. And I'll, I'll refer back to this example because I think it's a very easy uh, analogy to understand. Let's say that uh, I've already told you that on my exams, um, I say I'm going to watch everybody take the exam and make sure that people are not looking at over at other people's table or that they're not looking at notes, okay? They're not pulling out those programmable calculators and putting the notes on there. Has anybody ever taken a class where you have to have, can't have the programmable calculators? So that's just, that's always been weird to me because I'm going to say if a student really wants to try to program all that information into a calculator, that seems like more work than just learning the material because the pro putting the letters in those programmable calculators is a pain, okay? I always think that's one of those things that just seems kind of silly to me because so, so it, you know, it's just, it seems like more work than is necessary. And I'm going to tell you right now, you are welcome to use a programmable calculator in any one of my courses. Because if you just want to go through that amount of work, effort to cheat in the class, kudos to you. All right. Kudos to you. So I just don't think that's a likely. Plus, most of my stuff is qualitative anyway. So it doesn't really matter if you put all the notes in the programmable calculator. Anyway, regardless. Um, so uh, when we talk about uh, that, let's say that you ask that question. You say, Dr. Barnes. Uh, is it okay if we use a programmable calculator? And I'm like, I don't care, okay? Is it okay if we have notes? I don't care, okay? Is it okay if we uh, sit close to our friend and uh, are kind of looking over what they're writing? I don't care, all right? Do you guys see my point here? If I come into the classroom and I'm just like, I don't care what you do. What are you, what are you all going to view? How are you all gonna view controls with respect to cheating on the exam? Be like, I can get away with anything, all right? If instead of me watching you take the exam, I go walk outside and I go listen to uh, go listen to other instructors' lectures. I uh, play Slay the Spire on my iPad, which I do have that on my iPad, by the way. All right, and I send emails or I watch watch memes. Okay, while you guys are uh, doing your stuff, if I'm doing that, that sets a much different tone than if I'm sitting here watching you all take exams and ready to answer questions and trying to make sure that people aren't doing this. Which, by the way, that has happened in one of my classes. Well, I shouldn't say that. That happened in a course or class I was proctoring. Uh, class I was proctoring, and it was not even subtle. It was just like a direct line of sight. I'm just like watching and student going. All right. So yeah, that's my experience right there for you. Okay. By the way, if you're going to cheat in my class, don't do that. I definitely watch for that. Okay. I watch for a lot of other things too, but I'm not going to spoil that for you. Okay. So. 
So just uh, just note that I am watching out for stuff like that. Some of the stuff is pretty obvious. Some of the stuff is pretty obvious. Just remember, just remember, I'm a former forensics professional. You have to be better at cheating than I am at, at capturing it, detecting it. Okay, so that's a high bar. That's a high threshold. That's not a challenge, by the way. I'm just telling you. Okay, it's a high bar to cross. That's exactly right. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, you know? and uh, I've actually worked with people like Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Yeah. I, did, I actually went to a presentation with Brad Gavin Yale. It was pretty interesting. You know, he's a very, very bright guy. I mean, completely, totally unethical, but uh, yeah, very bright guy. He and other con artists have fully admitted that they have no sense of remorse. They only stopped doing it because they got <laughs> caught. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we we'll actually talk about that. In, we're actually going to talk about that in chapter 14, but we're going to talk about uh, kind of uh, the attitude that you take towards uh, doing things like that. There, the problem is, is that for some people that doesn't take any impetus whatsoever, they will cheat whenever they have the opportunity to. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of examples of people like that. Frank Ambanel is one of those, you know, very, very bright man, but he's fully admitted that, yeah, he would continue committing fraud for as long as he would possibly could because he had no sense of remorse whatsoever. And you can quote me on that. Yeah. So the next area we're going to talk about is the entity's risk assessment. So what did we say before? A control is a response to what? A risk. A risk. So what do we need to know if we're going to have controls? We need to know what are the risks. So this is the first step. This is the first step in order to create a control. We have to say, what are the risks that organization is subject to? So it involves identifying and analyzing the potential risk to organization, both internal and external. All right. So the process involves determining what relevant risks exist, assessing the likelihood of occurrence of these risks, estimating their significance, and deciding how to manage these risks. So this is a concept that's really important to understand, because remember back when we were talking about this much earlier in the semester, and I said, counting information is subject to uh, a, a fundamental uh, a pervasive constraint, that the benefit of providing accounting information has to be greater than the cost. Does everybody remember that, SFAC number eight? All right, it was on your first exam. Yeah, everybody did pretty well on that question, by the way. Uh, so SFAC number eight basically says the benefit of providing information has to be greater than the cost. This is an underlying concern in this area. We want to estimate the likelihood of occurrence and the significant of occurrence. So there's two things that we're considering. So likelihood of something taking place. Now imagine if a meteor hit the earth, all right? If a meteor hit the earth, would that affect business operations of most organizations? Absolutely. So why don't have most why don't most organizations take out meteor insurance as a control? It's probably because we don't think the likelihood is, is, is that high. We don't think there's a likelihood of meteor hitting Earth. Last time it happened was like 65 million years ago. OK, I, I roughly 65 million years ago. I wasn't there for that event. But uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, that would be one where you talk about the likelihood was well, significance is high, but the likelihood is very, very low. And so we don't bother with it. On the other side, if we say the likelihood at least reasonable, what about the significance? Well, the significance is usually uh, register, determined in, in terms of monetary value. So say that we're looking at a particular risk and we say this risk could possibly result in a, uh, a misstatement of the financial statements of $1,000. Does it make sense to put in a million dollar control to address that particular uh, risk? Probably not, okay? So when we consider this, we have to think about, all right, is it likely to happen? And if so, how big is this? How big of a problem is this? And so that's what we're thinking about when we talk about risk assessment. Once we've done that, we can decide how we are going to manage this for these risks. But this point right here, this is all about evaluating what risk, what, what risk exists. That's really hard to say, by the way. Which risks exist? That's even harder to say. Which risks exist? And then uh, which, 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 which risks exist? Wow. Uh, I have to say at that speed. And uh, determining their likelihood of significance if we think that there's at least a reasonable uh, possibility we need to address them, then we need to determine how we're going to address them. And that's our next step, okay? So what do we say? We said the management's responsible for designing, implementing, and maintaining internal controls. So design and implementation falls into this area right here. We talk about control activities. Control activities is our next step. And control activities basically say, these are the policies and procedures that address and manage identified risks. So this is a point where we create controls that are supposed to address the risks we identified in the previous step. So physical controls, we can say authorization of transactions, use of document records, safeguards over assets, records and data, and my favorite, segregation of duties, okay? And I put CAR there, what does CAR stand for? Stands for car, Dr. Barnes, is the word car, okay? It's a car. Custody of assets, authorization of transactions, recording of transactions, okay? 
Yes. If I ask that question and nobody knew the answer, then it's likely I'll ask that question on the exam. So if you don't remember what car is, write it down. Custody of, asset, custody of assets, authorization of transactions, recording of transactions. And why do I ask that question? Because it's my favorite question to ask. Okay. So I may ask that on the exam. Who knows? We also have IT specific controls. And then remember, these reflect in those categories we talked about earlier. So general access controls that operate at the entity level and application controls. So these can fall into three categories. These can be controls on input of information, controls on processing of information, and the controls on output. Remember, the application controls tend to be systematic in nature. So the controls themselves are going to be, are going to be uh, taking the part, or they're going to be taking place by the computer. So the computer will do, uh, implement those controls and provide feedback for us uh, when we review those controls. So again, as I said, entity is risk assessment. We identify the risks. This is where we create the controls that are designed to address those risks. Now, something that we talk about in 417, this is not relevant to this course, but it, it is kind of relevant to the COSO framework, all right, is we talk about two types of deficiencies and controls that can exist. There can be a deficiency in the design of controls, which basically means that the control was not created or it was not created properly. That would be what we concern ourselves with here, all right, where we say the control is not does not exist or the control was not designed properly so it doesn't work. There's another possibility. What if the control is present and designed properly, but it's not it's not working properly? Say, for example, we have segregation of duties set up. We have three people, one responsible for custody, one responsible for authorization, one responsible for recording. And so we have proper segregation of duties in the area, but somebody is absent on one day. They, 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 they're not there on work one day. So they basically email and says, you know what? I can't perform this authorization. Here's my password. You can authorize for me. And they give that to the person who's responsible for custody of trend or custody of assets. That violates that segregation of duties we just talked about. So when we talk about the operation of controls, the people who are responsible for those controls are not following the rules. So in order to make sure controls are operating properly, we have to convey the information. We have to convey what they're supposed to be doing. So this is our next step, information and communication. They support all the other control components by conveying details and responsibilities over internal controls. So again, if I implement segregation of duties, I wanna make sure you're responsible for custody, you're responsible for authorization, you're responsible for recording. And those responsibilities should never be shared between two people because that's the whole purpose of the purpose of the control, the whole purpose of the control, whole purpose of the control. When I get really excited, I start start talking badly. That's also a problem of getting old is that uh, I, the words that come out of my mouth are not the words I intend to say. It's just getting worse over time. You guys come and visit me in 10 years, I'm just gonna be saying porpoise over and over again. All right. So what are some control uh, concerns we have? What are some uh, communication we are concerned about? Well, internally, we definitely want to make sure our employees understand their role. All right. The person who's responsible for custody needs to understand they are the sole person responsible for custody of assets in an area. And they need to know what that responsibility entails. The departments need to understand what is their functional uh, responsibility within the function. So we talk about uh, revenue process. Remember, we talked about different functions in those areas. We talked about some people are responsible for uh, creating the uh, sales order. Some people are responsible for authorizing credit for the customers. Some are responsible for receiving, uh, receiving goods and services, or sorry, sh shipping out goods and services. Those all re represent different functional areas of the organization. Managers need to understand what those roles are. And then governance, those are oversight mechanisms. That's the board of directors and sometimes the audit committee if there's an auditor. So those are gonna be the ones who are responsible to understand what these roles entail as well. Also, we can communicate and provide information for external suppliers, for external vendors. So customers, suppliers, regulators, shareholders, people who are outside of the organization, but still have a stake in the benefit of the organization. So we want to make sure that we communicate this information externally as well, at least the information that's relevant to those people. So that's going to be an example of inf information communication. So again, control activities tend to focus on the design of those controls, the design implementation of controls. This also has this area right here it tends to focus on the maintenance of controls, so the operation of controls, making sure the controls are operating properly after they've been implemented. However, it's important to note this is probably not the only maintenance component we're concerned about. Remember, we were talking a little bit earlier, and I was saying that uh, there's a kind of a, a logical sequence to the components. What happens to risks over time? Do risks stay the same in, over time in an organization? 
Would we say that an organization that was founded that was founded back in the 1980s has the same exact risks that they had back then they have now? No. One thing that you probably note is technologi technologically speaking, the, our environment has changed. The technology has changed pretty substantially, so technology risks have definitely changed. We can probably look at a more compelling example. Let's say a movie theater that was operating in 2019. Would we say that their risks for 2019 were a little bit different than their risks for 2020? Yes, because the environment changed pretty substantially in 2020, okay? Movie theaters did not really do well during that fiscal year, all right? So that would be an example of the change in time. So we need to note the risks change over time. That's where we have the final component. This is monitoring. This is basically the ongoing evaluation of the design and effectiveness internal control by management. In other words, we determine what risks have changed and we update and adapt the controls as necessary. So this is more of a maintenance function, making sure that we maintain the controls and update where necessary. These findings should be evaluated, communicated in a timely manner, and modifications should be made as needed, which sounds very, very simple, but it's a really, really critical area. We think about this from a technology perspective, this is super critical. I've actually done audits for companies that were operating on the same technology software that they were operating on 30 years previously. This is true. Back in 2000, I think 2006, 2007, over that busy season, I was operating for a company or doing an audit for a company back in, uh, it was middle of uh, Texas. It's kind of like West Texas area. It's like Midland Lubbock area. And I did an audit for that company in that area. And legitimately, the co computer software they were using was the same computer software they were using in the early 1980s. All right. So imagine the risks that have changed over that time. It's really, really hard to adapt and update if your technology is not updated as well. So this is something very relevant with AIS when we talk about the technology adaptation that's necessary. All right, so that was the five components. Again, you're responsible, very, very responsible for those five components. I think this is the most important thing that you're gonna learn in this lecture for sure. And one of the most important things you need to do in the cohort course. Okay, so control environment, entities risk assessment, control activities, information communication and monitoring, okay? Don't just remember what they are, but make sure you understand what they represent with respect to the components. There is a 100% chance I will ask you a question on this. I would say there's a 100% chance I will ask you multiple questions on these concepts. So make sure that you know them. And by the way, I've never said that memorization is enough. Knowing those five terms is really, really good, but you do need to understand what they represent, which is also a problem for those of you who are planning on taking the CPA exam. Uh, one of the things Becker likes to do is they like to make these really, really fun acronyms. So their acronym for this is CRIME, all right? which just really annoys me because that says this uh, memorizing this is fine plus it's out of order e stands for existing control activities which is you know means that the sequence is stuff and i get really really upset at becker for doing that but uh, uh, at least it's an acronym that's all that really matters okay so let's talk about some other things that are still relevant but we're not going to go into as much depth with all right let's talk about the erm so we're not going to go into as much detail except to say that it expands upon 2013 to provide a broader view on risk management to maximize firm value so this is something that's going to be applicable to very large organizations that have the uh, resources necessary to actually implement different concerns. So you will notice that there's a few things that have been added here. We still have the same entity levels, but we've actually got four components. We've got a strategic component, and then we've got additional, sorry, objectives, my apologies. These are objectives. We've got a strategic objective, and then we've got some additional components as well. So additional objectives, strategic, additional components, objective setting, event identification, and risk response, okay? We're not going to go in depth as to what those mean. I would like for you to be able to identify those additions. All that I really want you to know is that ERM is just a bigger, more established version of the COSO internal control for integrated framework. Basically, all it says is, is that there are some additional concerns that we as a large organization have to take into mind. So we're going to establish a few more components and additional objectives so we can address these in more depth and detail. This, again, this is really only imp important for really big corporations. I would say really big organizations, they have to be multinational or smaller. Yes. Did COSO ERM come after COSO 2013? Uh, 2013 is the latest. Yeah, so uh, I say COSO 2013. COSO ERM, I think, was established back in the 1990s after the first COSO iteration. Okay. I think this ERM version is 2019. Don't quote me on that because I, I remember reading about it, but I don't remember. Uh, but the, the original ERM framework was created shortly after the integrated integrated framework, um, or shortly after, like a decade later, I believe. So it's really hard to say that, that, that these come in sequence because the original COSO framework came into play in the late 80s and the original ERM, came, came, ERM framework came into play in the late 90s. All right. So we also talked about 
a few other issues. We talked about uh, some IT governance concerns. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about what these represent. So first of all, we talked about COBIT. And COBIT is a framework for IT governance and management, which is a really broad statement, say IT governance and management. And COBIT is a very broad framework. It basically answers a lot of questions about how IT is incorporated in an organization. So how does it, what is its main objectives? What is the main goal of here? This is the, this one's kind of non-intuitive because we've been talking about internal controls and internal controls, we say at our response to risk, right? So if we think about COBIT, we'd say, well, it's a IT, it's an IT risk or control framework. So it must be focused on risk. It must be focused on security. Well, the very first thing you learn when you learn about COBIT is you learn that the goal is, is to maximize firm value, which really, really bothers me, by the way. I'd say, okay, I would want to make sure that we're managing risk before we maximize firm value. But again, it goes back to that cost benefit trade-off. If the risk itself is not uh, is not going to be uh, benefited by putting a control in place or managing the control, then we may not want to actually address that risk in the first place. Again, for the $1,000 risk, we don't want a million dollar control in place. So the first thing COBIT says is the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna maximize firm value through our IT system. The next thing is to make sure that IT resources are used responsibly and that IT risks are managed appropriately. So risk is actually the third priority with respect to the COBIT framework. So COBIT, again, very, very broad, very, very large in perspective. Um, it's going to be the one that kind of says generally uh, what issues need to be addressed, all right? What issues need to be addressed. The next one is going to be called ITIL, Information Technology Infrastructure Library. It is a global framework providing IT services and establishing the uh, scope of IT service management. So basically what this means, how this delineates from the previous one, is when we talk about COBIT, we're saying, what are the problems? What are the things we need to address? ITIL is more about how we're going to address these issues. So what issues do we address with respect to our service offerings? And what is it that we need to be able to implement with respect to that? So it organizes IT management to five high-level categories. I see there's a very, very low chance I'll ask you about these five categories since we're not going into it. But I do want you to remember that when we talk about ITIL, it does consider, we do consider service management, okay? So the service we're providing, how do we manage those? And uh, what risks are in place with respect to information technology? What uh, what uh, controls do we need to enact to re respond to those risks appropriately? All right, final thing. This is, this is our uh, final slide. Well, you know, I do have an end slide, but this is our final slide of information. We got there, guys. We got the ISO 27000 series, all right? So ISO 27000 series is addressed, designed to address information security issues. So again, it's important to note, we talked about COBIT, very broad. It's asking, that, it's asking the, what are, what are we addressing? We talked about ITIL, we're focused on service, okay? Providing information for the pieces of the organization. We talk about ISO 27000, this is more about security, making sure that information is conveyed in a proper manner, that we have proper controls in place to address the risks. Main objective of the series is to provide a model for developing something called an information security management system, an ISMS. It is really, really boring, long, and detailed if you want to go into it. But basically, at a very high level, all this is trying to say is that security is the primary focus. And we want to make sure that we understand how to manage the risks that are associated with the organization and how to implement the proper procedures to address those risks. So just to summarize the things that you will need to know, first of all, Make sure you know what the three governance frameworks are. Those are probably pretty obvious. That's very easy. What do they address? COVID is saying, we're gonna address IT governance and management. That's the how, okay? Talked about ITIL, we talked about uh, ISO 27000. This is the what, about what it is we need to do. ITIL is going to answer the question of how do we provide services to parts of the organization? And then ISO 27000 series, how do we provide security to the different uh, parts of the organization? If you remember that, you should be good to go for the exam. Again, a lot of information, but you guys were troopers. You hung in there with me. Thank you very much. There's still a lot of Red Bull left, so take a can if you need to for 303, I guess. And uh, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Sorry, Wednesday. 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 See you guys on Wednesday.